but I will talk about this. And both are coexisting. You know, we keep hearing things that is my job going because of tech? Is my job staying? What's happening? And we are sort of, our lives sort of involved with tech everywhere. Right at the time we wake up till, till we sleep. Even if we use this phone in our loo, even our loos are getting very tech enabled nowadays. So tech is sort of everywhere in our lives, everywhere. Even the government is getting smarter. So now Karnataka government by next month will have every family in Karnataka will have an electronic health card. Rajasthan government putting all your personal documents on a portal. If you apply for admission or you go for any property matter, you pick up your Aadhaar from the portal, the property papers, your fan card and just drop it as where you apply. So we're becoming paperless, though I'm carrying two pages together. But nowadays uh, people don't print. You know, the paper industry is hit hard, right from the train inspector to your boarding the flight, uh, it's all paperless. And, and technology, so how is technology really shaping our lives? You know, in, we see that uh, in technology, in, in a sector where, which I know best, or where I manage to fool people that I know everything, is healthcare. So I'm going to talk about that that how technology is uh, uh, coming to healthcare. But before I do come there, you should see that what is tech doing to our jobs? Tech is making life easier for us. It is making life easier for us, but at the same time, uh, a recent McKenzie report says that 800 million jobs are going to disappear by 2030. 800 million jobs. So what we have to make sure is that people in this room and around you, we are not part of the 800 million. That's important. Some of the jobs which are likely to disappear in the, in the coming few years would be what, what you see on the screen. Some of that you already see happening. We already have electronic mops and vacuum cleaners in our homes and malls, taking away the manual cleaning work. <coughs> we see we see a number of things being replaced by technology already. And, and some more jobs are under risk of being lost. So how do we manage that this does not happen to us? That's very important. So coming back to first thing that where is technology going? Let's talk about technology in healthcare. It's fast integrating into the healthcare industry. Uh, making it easier for patients, easier for doctors in saving lives. So whether it's robotic surgery, whether it's remote ICU management, or whether it's remote diagnosis. Now these sound like big words, actually they aren't. So what is really uh, remote robotic, robotic surgery? Uh, conventionally, if somebody had a problem in his head, a very thick part of the brain was cut and with scapules and scissors, the procedure was done. Now what's happening is, now a robo has come to help the doctor. The robo has seven, eight arms, and the doctor is sitting outside, and he's working on a PlayStation-like console. He makes a very small incision, and sophisticated equipment goes through the incision, does the treatment, and the patient is treated. But it is yet happening with the skill and the experience of the surgeon who is now sitting outside. And this kind of a procedure has many advantages. Very little damage to your skull, minimal blood loss, less infection, less chance of infection, and of course, quick recovery. So the traditional methods of going and robo is coming, but the doctor is not getting replaced. Important thing to remember. Because now the doctor has to, have to learn how to use the robo to, to operate and treat the patient. And all this is very necessary because there are 1,700 people and only one doctor as per medical council in India. So doctors can't reach everywhere. So that's why we need to increase the access which doctor has in the rural areas to the common man. And that's what happens in our remote ICU situation. So remote ICU is basically nothing but a critical care ward in a hospital. So you have the equipment in a remote town, say just outside Dehradun, 
uh, there's a critical care ward with beds and all the parameters to measure the patient's condition. That is connected to a big hospital in Delhi, and there's a very senior doctor who can examine that patient sitting in Delhi. And there's a very junior resident kind of person outside Dehradun who then alters the treatment and care depending on how the senior doctor advises it. So now we can have this senior doctor skill in remote areas, thereby making good quality health care available in rural areas. And because of the skew between the population number of doctors we have, we need technology like this. So technology is enabling us to reach out further and make sure we get high quality care throughout India. But now if you differentiate, let's say, technology in healthcare to, let's say, technology or big data in e-commerce, what happens there? There we are dealing with tangible products. We are dealing with people, big data and AI sort of uh, study behavior uh, and sort of follow you, retarget you, influence you, and compel you to buy some products, thereby creating demand. But in healthcare, we are not supposed to create demand. We don't want people, we can't, we can't make people fall ill. So healthcare is a necessity, whereas e-commerce and shopping is a want. So but technology is coming there also. And there's a different kind of big data and machine learning and digitization used in healthcare. Soon, very soon in our country, we'll see where hospitals are digitized, hospital systems talk to each other, and lakhs and lakhs of patient care data is kind of integrated. So doctor can see a vast amount of patient data when he's seeing one patient. And this will help us to publish uh, medical outcomes, which we don't do in this country today. We'll be able to do benchmarking. We'll be able to find out and compare hospitals that where are more hospital-induced infection deaths, what is the mortality rate, and things like that. The moment we start doing that, which is already happening in some countries, what will happen is increase competition and we put pressure on hospitals to improve the quality of care. And that's what we all want. So technology is clearly helping us go there. But my personal opinion is that technology, behind every technological breakthrough, every disruption will be a human person. It will be us who will be deciding what are the next disruptive things tech can achieve. So that brings me to the point that, you know, uh, I'm happy to say that uh, tomorrow and day after and day after, all of us will have our jobs. We will have our jobs, but uh, how will we retain them? We will be able to retain our jobs, provided we are one step ahead. We will yet have to use our brains to see what's the new technology breakthrough we want to do. And for that, we have to make sure that we are not obsolete. Otherwise, we will come into the jobs that may be phased out. And that's the biggest fear. So technology may be the king, but you and me are the queen and we wear the pants. And in order to wear our pants tomorrow also, uh, we will have to be one step ahead, we have to be innovating, we have to be creative and we have to be risk-taking. And this is what I want to now share with you, that this is what I did and how did I do it. I, unfortunately, by accident, the kind of businesses I was, which was consulting, healthcare delivery and now health tech. Uh, it was necessary to keep innovating and to keep doing new things. It was a necessity for, my, for me to grow those companies, which I grew. <coughs> and in order to grow those skills, uh, what do you really do? What did I do? So, what I learned was two age-old things. Uh, teach them fish, don't feed them fish every day. Teach them how to fish. Teach him how to swim and then let him lose. In addition to these two things, there were two learnings I had from my mentor, which I like to share with you. Very strong learning. They were not his words. He read it from somewhere. So the first one was uh, tyranny of art and the genius of hand. Now it sounds very vague, but what is it? 
we all have choices to make when we are working we have choices this or that so there's a tyranny of or that you choose one of the two but there's a there's a genius of the end that you have to do both the moment you master that into your life it makes a huge difference and the second learning was learn to change the tires of the car while traveling at 40 km these two things if you begin to use in your life you are all set to achieve far greater things now does it happen around us all these things yes they do they do but people have to invest people have to invest in yourself people have to coach you and you need to have the passion a very good example which comes to my mind are sports people pv sandhu became what she became because of the tireless efforts her family made her dad made all the investments they did in her all the coaches who invested effort in her and that's what helped her reach where she is today but that is not all it's not just the investment in you or in humans but it's also the passion she had the passion so it's investment in people and their people should have passion it's the combination of that which you see in every sports person who, who wins the gold medal they put in a lifetime effort to reach that place it goes with both with investment in the person and the passion some of you may identify with this or seen it with amongst your friends many of our parents force us to study from grade 9 onwards we start attending coaching classes to become a doctor to get into engineering school and then some kids realize that i have got into engineering school but engineering not my passion right have you seen some of your friends feel that way and then then that investment is becoming doubtful that why did the parents do put all that pressure so that that needs to be avoided totally so the other thing i want to leave with you last in the last 2 3 minutes is that how did i go about investing in people because i always be believed and till now i believe that the more you invest in people the more you surround yourself with intelligent good people the more better the organization will do so this investment when i used to pick up fresh mbas from schools and they used to work with me so i used to concentrate on three things with them just three things uh one was how to make them think strategically how do they do innovative stuff and the third thing the most commonly known is execution how do they execute the first two competencies innovation and strategic thinking uh cannot come by reading books or having a pill it has to come on the job by learning by thinking and, and experimenting new things by earn learning and learning raising the bar on yourself and it's a very osmosis process by which over time then you become good at those two things and then with innovation and disruption and strategic thinking you may develop a great product and you may go to market and you may be the first one to do it but to remain there you will need three things execution 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 so essentially if you concentrate on three things as you go forward is is how do you keep thinking and doing new things how to start thinking strategically 